Again, we bid you good morning and happy Sabbath. We trust and pray that wherever you are, be it at home or or wherever you may be receiving this broadcast, that you're having a wonderful Sabbath. And we pray that the Spirit of God will draw very, very near to you during this next time, uh, period of time that we are together. We thank you for joining us for our Sabbath school, uh, our worship service, the prayers, the praise, the music. We pray that it will prove a blessing to you. Now, just a couple of things that we want you to remember as we uh, meet together. Again, most of us, certainly here in California, are on lockdown. Churches are closed. But we ask that even though you're not in the church building, that you remember the church with your tithes and with your offerings. There are expenses that continue, things that must be taken care of. So again, please remember the church. Remember your local church with your tithes and with your offerings. We thank you again for joining us, and we pray in a very special way that this particular sitting with us as we worship the Lord together in spirit and in truth will prove a blessing to you as together we take one more step along that road that leads to glory. God bless you. Come and join us singing hymn number 125, Joy to the World. And nature sing, and have and nature sing, and have and have and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs implore, while fields and floods, rock hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonder and wonders of Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to our Sabbath School Roundtable. I'm in the company of Pastor Stephen Bohr, Elder Melvin Blue, and uh, we are going to be taking a look at lesson number 12 as we make our way to the end of the quarter and the end of the year uh, in preparation for 2021, which is coming upon us, Pastor, very, very quickly. Um, uh, we are going to be delving into the Sabbath, and it is interesting that the brethren chose when discussing education to put the Sabbath in as part of the education experience. Uh, looking at what happened in Eden, the education of our, our parents, Adam and Eve. And um, I like the little tag that's uh, uh, part of this lesson, experiencing the living and living, rather, the character of God. We know that the Ten Commandments, of which uh, commandment number four is a Sabbath commandment, are a transcript of the character of God. So there's an intimate connection in, in uh, the Sabbath, the commandments of God, the things that we can learn in looking at the Sabbath, in experiencing the Sabbath, in living the Sabbath. There's certainly much we can learn about our God. Um, Melvin, if you would be so kind as to open in prayer, then we're going to just sort of dive right into this very interesting lesson. Okay, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we're so thankful for the opportunity to come and to consider this lesson this morning for uh, our Sabbath school discussion, The Church at Steady. And as we open your word, we ask that you would open our eyes so that we see clearly what is printed in your word. We ask that you would open our ears and in doing so, stop the din of noise from the week gone past so that we can hear the still small voice that says, this is the way, walk ye in it. 
And then once our eyes have been opened and our ears have been opened, we ask that you would open our hearts so the truth that we have seen and heard can be implanted there. It can take root, it can grow, and it can change us into the image of the Christ. Because when we know when the Christ is lifted up, all men are drawn to him. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our memory text, as I mentioned a little bit ago, is one of my favorite. Uh, I don't know, this text just always appealed to me from the time I uh, committed it to memory. Uh, Mark chapter 2, 27, 28. There are similar texts found in Matthew and also in Luke, but I think Mark is the most concise in the way it states it. Uh, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, that is for mankind, uh, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, we could spend the next 30 minutes or so just, you know, sort of unpackaging uh, that particular text and uh, the number of things that are found therein. But we need to move on. Um, as we deal with the, the, the Sabbath portion of the lesson, the Sabbath afternoon portion of the lesson, gentlemen, um, we, we, we find that um, education is part of our personal development. I think that's the, the main theme for that particular portion of the lesson. And there is so much that can be learned as we study the Sabbath, as we study God's reason for creating the Sabbath, uh, making it for man, uh, as, as a benefit for man. And I, when I get to the kingdom, some of my many questions will deal with Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden experience and the Sabbath experience. There's a lot that I have to um, sort of sit down. If, uh, if the Lord has the time, he's going to have a few billion other people to talk to. <laughs> but I will get in line. I can wait. I got all eternity. That's I can right. wait till he gets to me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm not going to run out of time. But I have a lot of questions about, about the Sabbath. You might uh, have to wait in line. Yeah, I suspect, and I suspect a really long line, too. <laughs> but I won't lose my place, and he won't lose my place in line. Let's move over into Sunday, uh, a time to be astonished. The lesson, and the part I wanted to, to just touch on before I turn it over to you guys, um, is the fact that um, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and the lesson takes pains to bring this out, both deal with the creation story but from different perspectives. Mm. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, we might say, is a little more objective. It's a, it's a what happened kind of uh, account of what happened on this day. God, this, did this, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And then when we recount the story in Genesis chapter 2, it comes from a more relational aspect, a much more re, uh, relational point of view. And of course, we know that everything that deals with with man's working with God is, is relationship-based. He wants to be our personal savior. Uh, and we, we see this uh, right there in Genesis chapter two. Uh, the Bible opens with this understanding that God wants to be very close to us. He is not happy with distance. Distance was never his intention. He always wanted to be very available to us and us to him. But of course, sin got in the way. So we, we see this, this relational aspect of um, of man's relationship with God. In this, I've got one little thing, you know, and, I, and I'm a, a, a semantic word kind of guy. Uh, in the lesson, and then I'll, I'll let you guys jump in on this. Um, it says, how do, do your conclusions, that's in reading Genesis 1 and 2, help you understand what God's blessing, uh, what God's blessing of the Sabbath and making it holy might mean? Now, when, when, I, when I hear making it holy, my mind automatically says, ah, ah keeping it holy. And, the, and there is a, a difference because the Sabbath is holy. Uh, it is our job to maintain that holiness as we move through the Sabbath. We cannot make it holy per se. And, it, and it's a semantic kind of thing, but mm. that's, the kind of, that's how my brain kind of functions. <laughs> that, that we need to keep it holy. It is holy. And uh, it is our job to maintain that holiness uh, so that it can be a blessing to us as we move through the Sabbath day. I, I kind of read that same question as God, God's blessing the Sabbath and God making it holy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, instead of something then, we do. It's we something do. that he did mm -hmm. and something that we follow. Uh, it, it, um, 
also impressed me uh, as I looked at this portion of the lesson with, as you mentioned, the relational aspects, that the Sabbath is the first full day that man spends yes. with God, with his wife, with uh, the animals, with, uh, you know, uh, the, the, all, of, all of the other creation that God has provided for him. Mm. And so he really gets to explore everything that God has laid out for him uh, and all the things given for his happiness on the Sabbath. You know, mm. this, this is relationship at its best. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I'm thinking, he, it's his first day, he wakes up from creation and he sees Eve. You know, there's so much sensory input. It's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Eve, okay. <laughs> so from then on, his relationship to the Sabbath is going to be good because that's the first day he got to see Eve, who Ellen White says, very beautiful, very symmetrical, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then he's got all of these other aspects of nature to be involved with, to look at, to enjoy. So as far as sensory input is concerned, it's a full, full day because yes. there's so much to learn and so much to see and so much to understand. Pastor? I just wanted to say that uh, that first Sabbath is really the Lord's Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It's only after the day ends that it becomes Adam and Eve's Sabbath. Yes. However, Adam and Eve entered God's rest on that first Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something that surprised me a few years ago is that uh, the Sabbath was not made holy until it ended. Yes. I used to think, you know, that as the Sabbath was beginning, God told Adam and Eve, now this day is holy, keep it. But then studying more carefully, I realized that the Sabbath, God made the Sabbath holy after the entire day passed. And during that day, God was enjoying his creation with Adam and Eve. Yes. In other words, he was, uh, he was showing them everything that he had made, his power and his love, that he gave to them, and then when the day ended, God says to Adam and Eve, now did you see what we did today? Now you're going to work starting <clears throat> the first day of the week, you're going to start working, and you're going to work six days like I did, and next Sabbath, you're going to do what we did today. Right, right. So, uh, you know, there's a statement from Ellen White, which is extremely important, I consider. It's in Councils on Education, page 190. Uh, when we observe the Sabbath, we are commemorating the Creator's rest. Yes. It's not about our rest. We're commemorating His rest. Uh, Ellen White wrote, The first six days of each week are given to man for labor because God employed the same period of the first week in the work of creation. On the seventh day, man is to refrain from labor in commemoration of the Creator's rest. So when we keep the Sabbath... We are commemorating the, the Creator's rest. And that's the reason why we can't keep the Sabbath on Sunday. Because memorials are rooted in history. For example, my anniversary is December 23. My wife would think I was crazy if I said, let's celebrate it on January 23. <laughs> because that's not when the historical event took place. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the same of 9-11. Uh, when do they read the 3,000 names? On, on September 12th? <laughs> No, it won't work. Why? Because the date is rooted in history. Mm -hmm. And so we cannot commemorate the Creator's rest on Sunday because that's not the day in which he rested. You know, I heard you make that, that, that statement about the Sabbath being holy from the end of the... It, it to coin a term, became holified as God moved through the Sabbath mm -hmm. because he gave the example. Uh, and you may not remember, years ago I interviewed you and you, you made that statement. And since it challenged my belief at the time I went home and I really <laughs> pondered that, it, it did, because I, I had the, the, the belief that you held, that basically it was done by fiat before the day, mm -hmm. uh, 
but actually his, his moving through the day gave us the example of how to keep the day and de facto or ipso facto made it holy at yeah. the end of the day. He looked back and say, that's how you do it. So next Sabbath, do that and you'll be keeping the Sabbath holy. And I thought about that for quite a long time and I said, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. It really does. If Here's, I could read a statement from oh, Ellen White. Just, just, I was going to read the, probably the same thing. <laughs> okay, I don't know. I got one too, so maybe. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. This is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 47. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it says, after resting on the seventh day, yes. God sanctified it. Yes. Or set it apart as a day of rest for man. Following the example of the creator, man was to rest upon this sacred day. Mm -hmm. That as he should look upon the heavens and the earth, he might reflect upon God's great work of creation and that as he should behold the evidences of God's wisdom and goodness, his heart might be filled with love and reverence for his maker. Talk about a relationship. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Sabbath is all about a relationship. Yes, 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 yes. I had uh, Patriots and Prophets 47, and since it has been so well intoned by Brother Blue, <laughs> I'm going to read something else. <laughs> but that, that, that kind of puts a seal on it, doesn't it? Yes. It, kinda, it tells us yeah. the, the process by which God worked. Um, but this is, this is more of a general statement about Adam and Eve in, in Eden. Very happy were the holy pair in Eden. Unlimited control was given them over every living thing. That, that statement alone pre pre pricks my conscience and my mind. My ears kind of went up. Unlimited control was given them over every living thing. How do you get unlimited control over flowers and, and almost inanimate objects? Uh, the lion, the lamb sported peacefully and harmlessly around them or slumbered at their feet. Birds of every variety and color, plumage filled the trees and flowers while their mellow tone music echoed among the trees, sweet accord and the praises to their creator. Adam and Eve were charmed with the beauties of their Eden home. They were delighted with the uh, little songsters around them, wearing their bright yet graceful plumage and warbling forth their happy, cheerful music. This gives you an idea of, of the atmosphere uh, that's around. The holy pair united with them and raised their voices in harmonious songs of love, praise and adoration to the Father and his dear Son for the tokens of love which surrounded them. They recognized uh, the order and harmony of creation, which spoke of wisdom and knowledge uh, that were infinite. Some new beauty and additional glory of their Eden home they were continually discovering, and that's what's going to happen throughout eternity. There's so much to know that we don't know, uh, which filled their hearts with deeper love and brought forth from their lips expressions of gratitude and reverence to their creator. So this was the atmosphere that not only pervaded that first Sabbath, mm -hmm. but the whole Edenic pre-sin experience. So we, we, Beautiful. we thank the Lord um, for that. So... I think that the, the point that the lesson is, is begging here is that that first Sabbath was an exquisite learning experience. There mm -hmm. was much being taught, uh, including the, the fundamentals of how to keep the Sabbath holy mm -hmm. and what one is to do on the Sabbath. Yep. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 47. We've all got it. That's, <laughs> that is one that we... <laughs> That is one that we need to keep in mind. Obviously, that's what the Lord would have us to talk about and to mention because all three of us had it independently. But, but you know, this is not some invention of Ellen White. Uh, when you look at the fourth commandment, mm -hmm. the fourth commandment makes it very clear mm -hmm. that God sanctified and blessed the Sabbath day when it ended. Mm. Because it says in verse uh, 11, after saying that we're supposed to work six days and rest on the seventh day, it gives us a reason. It says in verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, mm -hmm. and rested the seventh day. Therefore, mm -hmm. the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Yes. yes. Because he rested. Because he rested. He blessed it and hallowed it. Mm -hmm. So uh, very clearly <laughs> Ellen White was right uh, when she said that uh, the Sabbath is blessed and becomes holy when it ended. Mm. Well said, well said. You know, time goes so quickly, uh, uh, looking to the clock on the wall, and uh, of course when you're having fun studying the word, the clock is your enemy. So let's go to Monday <laughs> and look at a time for rediscovery. All right, so we are several, several, several centuries uh, following. The children of Israel have been in uh, uh, Egypt for 
400 years, uh, give or take, and their relationship with God has been dulled by a passage of time when they were not allowed to worship, when they were not free to worship. Mm -hmm. And really, uh, the Egyptians were not concerned about their worship habits or their worship style, and uh, they were slaves. And um, so now, as they are brought out of Egypt, they've got to rediscover, they've got to reacquaint themselves with uh, their God, how to worship their God, how to serve their God, and what God wants from them. Um, the lesson says they need to rediscover who the God is who asks their worship and gives them so many promises of an amazing future. This is something, gentlemen, that we need to sort of reacquaint ourselves with periodically in our lives. We need to ask ourselves, why do we worship? What are we worshiping? How are we worshiping? And of course, if you look at the three angels' messages, uh, those are questions that are dealt with in those messages again. Why do we worship? How do we worship? When do we worship? Is our worship acceptable? Every now and again, that needs to be re-ratified, re-verified in, in our lives. You know, we started out in, in uh, the first part of the lesson talking about creation and, and the relationship that was developed during the Sabbath hour, uh, the Sabbath hours. And what we find uh, as, as we read through Scripture following you know, um, Israel through bondage and now coming out is that um, the, there's, a, there's a linkage between their relationship with God and their Sabbath-keeping abilities. Mm. As Sabbath-keeping becomes uh, less significant, the relationship with God also becomes less significant. They have to be brought back uh, into this relationship. And, and, and as we read through Scripture, we find that, that uh, correlation occurring over and over and over again. You know, as, as, as relationships with God wane, it's also, you know, you can look at Sabbath keeping and you'll see it indicated there as well. Mm. I think it's an interesting point. Pastor? The, the Sabbath is a sign of God's power. You know, when God established the Sabbath at the beginning and gave Adam and Eve, so to speak, the scenic tour of the garden, they were very much aware of the power of God in creating all of this in six days. Uh, but the Sabbath has another dimension going to this section of the lesson, uh, Monday section of the lesson. Uh, and that is, if you read Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 to 15, God says to Israel, you should keep the Sabbath because you were slaves in Egypt. And, I, and my, by my power, I redeemed you mm -hmm. from Egypt. Mm, yeah. So now they had two reasons to keep the Sabbath, creation and redemption. And, of course, redemption took tremendous power on the part of God. They saw them, all the you know, plagues in Egypt, how God opened the Red Sea, how the Egyptians were drowned. You know, God gave a bread from heaven and he gave water from the rock. Uh, you know, the Sabbath was to remind them of everything that God had done for them, his love for them yes. and his power. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, once again, you have the idea of the relationship you know, them seeing the power of God and the love of God so that they would respond in a loving relationship with him. Unfortunately, the Sabbath became only a legal requirement. Yes, yes. Um, I, I was just looking at Exodus 31, 13, um, that it is also a sign of sanctification. Um, the reestablishment of the relationship was born out through um, the, the manna experience. Again, they had to put their faith in God to do precisely as he said. Take it one day each day. On the sixth day, take two. It will not spoil. Uh, that, that was a, a, an act of faith. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, I, I don't remember exactly the, the reference that uh, Ellen White gives in, uh, an understanding that if, if the world were to keep the Sabbath, and, and, and think about this, gentlemen, if everybody ceased their work, and came into a worship experience on the seventh day. There certainly could be very few atheists, if any at all. We'd have this constant reminder of the presence and power of God um, that would be fostered through keeping of, of the Sabbath. So the, the Sabbath is a sign of a very special relationship 
uh, between God and his people. Now, something came to me, you know, late at night and unsupervised. <laughs> <laughs> and as you mentioned, you know, that uh, this uh, Sabbath uh, being also a sign of sanctification, you know, it was interesting that the children of Israel were to collect the manna each day for six days. And, uh, and then on the sixth day, twice as much. And God kept it through the Sabbath hours without breeding worms or stinking, mm -hmm. without, without it rotting. And it, it, it spoke to me about God's ability, you know, to preserve me uh, and then at a point, even though there may not be physical manifestation, God is still there. He's still with me. He's able to carry me. <clears throat> um, I, you know, we, we kind of merge in this Sabbath experience, mm. you know, um, and, and his holiness becomes my holiness, you know. Uh, it, it, to me, it was just, it was just a, kind of a portrait of the idea of sanctification, mm. you know, uh, that, that, that God is in me, you know, uh, keeping me. And, uh, and it, it's different than, than, than this experience I've had all week. You know, it's, it, it's a new kind of experience now. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it's just something that flashed in my head, and I said, well, maybe I'll mention that since the opportunity came up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the lesson says before we leave Monday, you're talking to a teenager who is finding Sabbath keeping, and I've got this in quotes, boring. What do you say? What do you do? Uh, it occurs to me that um, you, you spend time in worship, because that is what the Lord has called us to do. But um, when we had the opportunity, I'm a city kid, uh, grew up in Buffalo, New York. Uh, when we had a chance to get out in nature and actually put some legs on the Sabbath, um, to see the creation of God, to study things of, in nature, to go to the park, um, uh, those kind of things, um, that helped me contextualize the Sabbath experience to see you know, different things in nature, um, which are certainly appropriate, but they were also teaching experiences that our Sabbath school teacher uh, made for us so that we could, you know, some people like to learn by touching and seeing and, and handling and being out in there, uh, getting out of the building and getting into nature because there's so much we can learn uh, from nature. I think sometimes we miss the messianic dimension of the manna episode. Um, you know, it's interesting that at creation, uh, God finished, actually Jesus is the one who's creating, mm -hmm. uh, he finished the sixth day and then ceased the rest of the seventh day. In redemption, we have the same thing. Mm -hmm. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished on the sixth day. And then he rested in the tomb on the Sabbath. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a connection with the manna episode here because... Uh, on the Sabbath, the manna did not breed worms or stink. Mm -hmm. And John chapter 6, verse 51 says that the manna represents the flesh of Christ. Yeah. And so Jesus, the sixth day, says it is finished. And the seventh day, his flesh, which is represented by the manna, mm -hmm. did not breed worms or stink. It did not begin or continue the process of decomposing. Decompose, yeah. And the interesting thing is, while he rested in the tomb, the women and others rested outside the tomb. They didn't fully understand that they were resting in the works of redemption. They would come <laughs> to understand that later. Yeah. But God wanted, to, Jesus wanted to teach them, you know, through my power, I, you know, I bore, the sin, bore your sins. And uh, it's finished. You know, the provision for salvation is finished. Now you can rest in what I have done. They didn't understand it at that point, but later on they came to understand mm -hmm. the relationship between the Sabbath and redemption. Praise the Lord. Well, as you were speaking uh, to, to, to tie these two thoughts together, uh, as a young kid growing up in South Central Los Angeles, uh, there was a family, the Dickersons, in, in Pasadena, Charles Dickerson and his family. And... and uh, he would invite us at times to desk council gardens, uh, just a little out of the Pasadena Eagle Rock area, large area, acres of 
plants and flowers and all kinds of things. And we would have lunch there. And, you know, it's, for me, I, I got to see my friends, Chuck and Roger. <laughs> that, that was the greatest thing about that. But my parents just uh, loved all of this natural beauty. And it wasn't until I got older that I, I began to understand and to see the beauty in nature and all of its textures and variations and and then begin to reflect on, you know, what a great God, you know, that put all of this together mm. for my enjoyment. Yes. Yeah. And and also gave me my friends to relate to as well. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's infinite in, in his ability. And so, um, you know, different folks need different things at different times. Yes. You know, but uh, our relationship is growing with God, you know. And uh, if we can help our young folk come to an understanding that is God that has prepared all of these things for them, mm -hmm. their friends, the na nature around us, you know, uh, all of these things, you know, are for our benefit. Then, uh, you know, and in time, I think they tie these things together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to, to what you, you alluded to, Pastor, you know, Christ finished the work of redemption when he died on the cross. Uh, and, of course, I, I see Sunday morning as kind of the cherry on the Sunday. You know, um, uh, he rose again, so I have the, the, the confidence now that I'm <laughs> going to live again. But the, the work was done on Friday. When it is finished, he finished it. He was consistent in that he took his rest on Sabbath, and then he gave us another scoop on Sunday morning when he came <laughs> forth. <laughs> you so when you, when you say the cherry on the Sunday, are you talking about the Sunday, or are you talking about the Sunday ice uh, cream? Uh, I was, I, actually, I was talking about the Sunday <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> no pun intended. I was talking about the Sunday. <laughs> you know, that, that never entered my oh, mind. It, just <laughs> it was indeed the cherry on Sunday, on the Sunday. But um, uh, you get my point. <laughs> that, that he finished the work and then he gave us this little added assurance when he rose I know that 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 uh, I have the promise that if I die in Christ I will live again also because uh, he, he rose again Amen. so that's a, a wonderful wonderful point thank you for that on Tuesday time for learning priorities um, ups and downs of Israel experience you know when you when you boil it all down Israel was guilty of two things, that they never really got right for any length of time, idolatry and Sabbath breaking. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if, you, if you, you take off all the manifestations of those two basic sins, that's what it boils down to, idolatry and, and, and Sabbath breaking. And um, in, in um, Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 and four, uh, 1 through 14, there is much to be said there. But what is interesting, because verses 4 through 6 deal with, with fasting, and, and um, I remember in reading uh, a recent uh, book that I was rereading for the second time, where Ellen White quotes from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 5 and 6. You know, just prior to the Civil War, um, the United States officially called days of fasting and prayer uh, as early as 1861 uh, because they could see, and of course Ellen White had that vision in um, Roosevelt, New York in 1861. She saw clearly we're, we're heading towards war. It's not going to be averted. But there were others who saw it, and they said, well, let's, let's fast and pray. And she said, you know, the Lord is not accepting these days of fasting and prayer because you're not dealing with the problem. You're not dealing, you know, the, the, the fast is to loose the bonds. Uh, so she, she went right back to Isaiah chapter 58. The point is that playing church or accepting the forms of worship are not the same as worshiping from your heart. You can go through the motions. You can go through the forms. You can go through those things that look like real worship, but they are not. Um, worship has to be an an intense heart experience between you and your God. Um, and just the trappings of worship are not sufficient to be acceptable to the Lord. Well, you know, as you started out talking about, you know, the, the two sins that you see in Israel's history, 
idolatry and Sabbath breaking, mm -hmm. those those things then become linked together. They're related. Yes. Because, oh, yes. Uh, you know, idolatry is denying the one who created or, or, or replacing him with something else. And then Sabbath keeping is directly created, uh, uh, directly correlated to creation, mm -hmm. you know. And so once one goes away, the need for the other tends to go away as well. Uh, and so it's only in the idea that we see God as creator that Sabbath takes on any significance. Mm -hmm. if, if that's not true, then, then we lose Sabbath. You know, the key passage in uh, Tuesday's lesson is Isaiah 58. And um, the gist of Isaiah 58 is that the Sabbath is the special day mm -hmm. to bless those who are less fortunate than us. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the Israel had two different stages with regards to the Sabbath. In the Old Testament, they basically trampled on the Sabbath. Right. In the New Testament, they idolized the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in the times of Christ, which is the next section of the lesson, the Sabbath became an end in itself. And ignoring the needs of people. If you read Isaiah 58, uh, and maybe we can go there just for a moment, uh, right before talking about the Sabbath, mm -hmm. Isaiah uh, tells us what Sabbath observance is all about. By the way, what day did Jesus especially take to heal the sick? There are seven Sabbath. miracles of Jesus on the Sabbath. <laughs> Sabbath. On the Sabbath. Yes. And he aggravated the religious leaders because he was helping people. <laughs> right. they, because he was violating the Sabbath. To them, the Sabbath was more important than people. But the Sabbath is for blessing people. And uh, so in Isaiah 58, uh, you have uh, verse, verse six, six, is this not the fast that I have chosen to mm -hmm. loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him, and you not hide yourself from your own flesh? And then notice, then your light shall break forth like the morning, yes. your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. You know, this is talking about the loud cry of Revelation 18, where the whole earth is filled with God's glory. It's not just not doing anything on Sabbath. It's actually what we're doing, doing on Sabbath. Sabbath in blessing other people. Uh, you know, as God blesses us on Sabbath, we bless others as well. Very true. The, the, the Jewish community was almost predisposed to break the, the moral obligations of the Sabbath because of their mindset to those who are not Jews. And, and we as Adventists can fall into that same category. This is about us. No, it's not. It, you know, it's, it's not. It, and, and, and you're looking at the Sabbath of the wrong way. It's not for secession of labor. It's for changing your labor from benefiting. God has given you six days to work for you, your family, and, and your, your people. Right. On the seventh day, flip that around. And let's live to bless other people and to do things that, that make them better. Which is why in verse 13, you know, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. The problem is not pleasure, it's your pleasure. Right. Uh, uh, right. And call a Sabbath a delight, holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. So consequently, there is a blessing in helping others that uh, reveals itself in the kinds of things you do on Sabbath. Well, the misinterpretation, I think, partially comes in the idea of labor. You know, mm -hmm. in our minds, we normally think of labor, you know, as something we do, you know, and um, we do typically for ourselves, you know, but we don't parse it out that much. We just say labor. Well, anything that requires energy for us <laughs> is labor. And so on the Sabbath, we get to cease from from labor and and you'll see this also in 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 uh, as, as one of the issues with israel mm -hmm. you know uh because you know it was carrying a burden it, you know the man who carried his mat after he was healed uh, this is this is, this is not right on the sabbath this requires energy you know walking so many steps uh you know there was just a whole host of these regulations that had to do with the expenditure of energy uh, but it's you know the idea is that on the sabbath our expenditure of energy is God-focused. 
It's not sustenance focused for ourselves. And that relates back to the manna uh, you know, episode because the manna uh, you know, was something God gave and kept. We didn't have to, we, they didn't have to work for it. They didn't have to go pick it up on the Sabbath. It mm. was there mm. already for them in their homes because they got it on Friday. You know? And so it's the idea that, um, that we are able to do for God or in, with God on Sabbath, and that, that, that's not to sustain ourselves or to enrich ourselves. That is to demonstrate our relationship with God. So on Sabbath, we cease from our work so he can do his. Exactly. <laughs> well said. Well yeah. said. You know, the, hard, the hardest <laughs> Sabbath I ever worked was the Sabbath. Uh, I was pastoring the Ebenezer Seventh-day Adventist Church in Freeport, New York. On Friday night, my first elder's house burned almost to the ground. And uh, I got word right after Sabbath school uh, someone told me, I said, okay, we're canceling worship service. Let's meet at the elder's house and try to help him. Uh, and someone said, no sermon? I said, our sermon will be preached out there at that guy's house. Mm -hmm. And the women got food together, and we spent, we stayed there till dark, and it was in the summertime. Mm -hmm. We stayed there till dark, digging through, helping him out, and people from the neighborhood saw that. They knew he was a Sunday Adventist, and uh, sort of marveled at what we, we sang, and we we got sweaty and we got dirty, but I feel we were doing the work of the Lord yeah. in, help, in helping him out. Yeah. And there were others who, uh, who, who saw that also. Yeah, you know that you can talk about like holy purchasing on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've had church members that have gotten uh, sick. They need medicine. That's yes, fine. So <laughs> what do I do? I say, well, wait till sundown and suffer all day Sabbath. <laughs> no, no, you go and you buy the medicine and you give it to them. Yes. That's what Jesus would have done. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not doing your work and for your own good. You are doing it to bless other people. Indeed. Yeah. And this, this kind of, and I'm looking at a time, um, <laughs> this sort of ties together Wednesday and Thursday, a time for balance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, as, 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 Adventists, as people of God, we need to be balanced so that we don't make a laughing stock of our religion and that our religion has legs on it. Um, you're not working for yourself, but you are working to help and bless the community and those who are in need. Um, so to do work on the Sabbath uh, is not the issue, is what kind of work and who are you glorifying in the work that you do. Yes. Right. Yeah, I, I was reading, I think it's from Selected Messages in Volume 3, I think Ellen White talks about uh, a time when they uh, used boats on the Sabbath to, to cross the river to, to uh, preach to those on the, on the other side. Mm. And the people were kind of surprised that they would expend all this kind of energy and labor, you know, on the Sabbath, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, but she says, you know, but we're doing good. Yes. You know, that, that's the idea. We're, it's not, we're just going over just to set up something where we make some money or something. No, we're, we're going over to share the gospel. So our yeah, work yeah. then is sanctified. It is for the Lord. Praise yeah. the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, very quickly, um, was in Nicaragua several years ago. There is an island. Uh, there's an Adventist church on the island in the middle of Lake Nicaragua. You go to the city of Grenada, and you've got to take a boat to go over there. Those, those boat uh, owners are so trusting of the Adventist community, they just keep a little record and they know they'll be settled up on, on Sunday. <laughs> but the Adventists have been so faithful, they have baptized maybe half a dozen of those boat owners, you know, who, who go across and, and, and do that kind of, uh, kind of work. Um, you know, our time has slipped into eternity. Hopefully, you are studying this lesson thoroughly. Hopefully, you have learned a couple of things. One, that the Sabbath was made for man. That's the key text, and not man for the Sabbath. So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. Uh, and what is good? Well, he has showed thee what is good. Old man, what is good? But to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Again, we ask God's blessing upon you, upon your study. Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. God bless you. We'll see you next time. I trust that the Sabbath school class today was a great blessing to you. God has blessed us tremendously by giving us one day in the week where we can just bask in his love and in his power and in the beauty of his character. Before we begin our worship service, we do want to have a word of prayer to ask the Lord to bless all of the components. So please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your wonderful Sabbath day. We thank you because we can worship you in spirit and in truth, even though we can't do it in person. We ask, Lord, that you will bless the worship service, 
that you will bless those who are tuned in and watch. I ask, Lord, that you will bless them abundantly. Be with your people in these difficult times. And we thank you for your presence. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Hi, boys and girls. Today, it's Auntie Carolyn here to tell you a story. And today, the story is about Molly Dog. She's a Springer Spaniel, and they can get up to 50 pounds. Not every Springer Spaniel looks exactly like this, but I wanted you to have an idea of what a Springer Spaniel looks like. They're a fun-loving, friendly dog, but if they've had a difficult life, it shows sometimes they're too difficult. It's just too difficult for them. This dog, Molly, I'm telling you about, she was a wonderful dog, but not when we first got her. Her first year, unfortunately, she was abused terribly. And because of that, she had a lot of behavior problems. She'd been sent back to the shelter uh, several times. And we got her, she was over a year old. And after we got her home, we realized just how damaged she was. She wanted to be in our laps, right up next to us. She would not eat her food unless we were standing right there. And when we left for work, she destroyed the house. We didn't know what to do. We talked with each other and tried to figure out how we could help Molly. We just didn't have the heart to take her back to the shelter because after all, she'd already had that done to her over and over in her little life. So we just started trying to work on how we could help Molly. So every day I took her out for a walk. I walked her and walked her. I started teaching her a few little commands. She liked getting her doggy biscuits. So when she got her doggy biscuits, that made her want to do things better. Little by little, we got her to where she wasn't so rowdy. She didn't have to be in our laps all the time. She didn't growl and bark every time we saw another dog or tried to pet another dog. She started calming down. We said, oh, we're starting to get her trust. Trust is very important. So pretty soon, we could actually say she was a well-behaved doggy. And she used her manners most of the time. She got better and better about listening, better and better about not scaring other dogs. She let us pet other dogs. We could take her walking and she didn't act up. She didn't have to jump in our laps the minute we sat down. She could eat her food without us standing next to her. It was wonderful to see the transformation in Molly. And it was all because of trust. She started trusting us. Boys and girls, do you know someone who misbehaves, doesn't know how to act around people? Maybe they haven't had a really good life. Maybe somebody has abused them and they don't trust anybody. I bet if you said a prayer in your heart and you became a friend to that person, just one friend is all we need sometimes. That person could learn to trust. They could trust you and you could show them what kindness can do. Boys and girls, it is so important to be kind to people and to learn how to trust. If we get one person to trust us and be that person's friend, it can make all the difference in their life. And then they can have more than one friend and they can start trusting people again. It's very good to be a good friend. To have a good friend is to be a good friend. So let's try and be a good friend and have people trust us because we'll be trustworthy. Now let's have Jesus come into our heart. We're going to say a little prayer now. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the stories we learn. We thank you that Molly turned out to be a really good dog. We thank you that we know how to trust, that we trust you and that you will always be there for us. We can always feel your presence, Lord. You always send the Holy Spirit to be with us. Help us now to be a good friend. Keep us in your care always, Lord. In thy name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and 
write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. When the sky shall unfold
Jerusalem TV is a worldwide Christian ministry providing Christ-centered programs with clarity and power on topics such as Bible prophecy, end-time events, Bible interpretation, tips for healthful living, cooking demonstrations, and much more. Our programs provide practical counsel for daily life and assurance in these uncertain times. Download the free Sum TV app or watch online at sumtv.org. You will be blessed. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, as we open your word, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Give us understanding. Help us, Lord, to realize the times that we're living in and to be faithful to you no matter what might come. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Sabbath school lesson today was on the Sabbath, the educational value of the Sabbath. So I decided that I would preach a sermon that has to do with the same theme, the theme of the Sabbath. Now some Old Testament scholars have referred to Isaiah 24 through 27 as the little apocalypse of the Old Testament. The reason is because these chapters have many features in common with the book of Revelation. In this study we're going to take a look at Isaiah chapter 24 where we find many of those links or connections with the book of Revelation. I would like to begin by reading from Isaiah chapter 24 and verses 17 to 23 where we find a description of the second coming of Christ. This is how it reads. It's speaking about individuals who are fleeing from the one who is coming again. It says, Fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. Now let me just stop there for a minute. Luke 21 verse 35, Jesus said, referring to His second coming, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So there we have a connection. Once again, fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. And then it speaks about individuals fleeing. And it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. Once again, the word snare. You have people here fleeing from the coming of Christ. Of course, this is reminiscent of Revelation chapter 6 and verses 14 through 16, where the wicked are hiding in the caves and the rocks of the mountains. So we find once again, reading verse 18, And it shall come to pass that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. This is the great earthquake when Jesus comes. You can read in Revelation 16, the seventh plague. Verse 19, the earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. Verse 21, It shall come to pass in that day, that is the day that Jesus comes, that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones. This is Satan and his angels. And on the earth the kings of the earth. Verse 22, what is the punishment? They will be gathered together, as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison, after many days they will be punished. Of course, the many days there are a thousand years. And then after the many days, we have a vision of Mount Zion in Jerusalem, verse 23. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before His elders gloriously. So let's summarize some of the salient features that we find in this passage which describes the second coming of Christ. A global cataclysm or catastrophe, the second coming of Christ. 
at the time of his coming he punishes Satan and his angels and the wicked kings of the earth by shutting them up in prison. Satan and his angels bound to the earth and the wicked dead, of course. And we're told that Satan and his angels and the wicked will remain in that prison for many days, which Revelation interprets as a thousand years. Then after the many days, the second stage of punishment upon Satan and his angels and the wicked will take place. They will be destroyed according to the book of Revelation. And then in Isaiah chapter 24 as well as in Revelation 21 and 22, you have a vision of the New Jerusalem and Mount Zion where the sun and the moon are ashamed, a direct connection with Revelation 21 and verse 23. And then we're told that God will reign in Zion and in Jerusalem before His ancients, I don't have time to get into a description of that, but that is describing actually uh, the representatives of the worlds that never sinned who gather in heavenly council. So once again, after everything is finished, God reigns in Zion and Jerusalem and before His ancients or His elders gloriously. This entire description that we read in Isaiah is picked up in Revelation to describe events at the second coming, during the millennium, and after the millennium. Now let's go a little bit earlier in the chapter and read uh, a description about the same event, the second coming of Christ. Isaiah 24 and verses 1 to 3. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty, and makes it waste, distorts its surface, and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor, the land shall be entirely empty and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. Kind of reminds us of Jeremiah chapter 4, where Jeremiah sees the earth after the second coming. He says, it was without form and void. Void means empty. So in other words, this world will return to the condition it was in before creation week. Now the question is, why is this destruction coming? Well, the Bible tells us why this destruction is coming upon the earth, and there's no, not going to be any distinction. The great people and the common people are, that are not ready, that have rejected Jesus Christ, are going to suffer the same punishment. Why do these things take place on this earth? Why the desolation and the destruction? Isaiah 24 verses 4 and 5 explains it. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. And now comes the explanation as to why. The earth is also defiled. That word defiled is important. It means to soil, to corrupt, to pollute something morally. In other words, it has to do with God's moral law. So once again, the earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. Now the question is, why was the earth defiled under its inhabitants? Three reasons are given. Notice what it says. Because, so the earth is defiled, and the earth is destroyed, for three specific reasons. Number one, because they have transgressed the laws. Number two, changed the ordinance. Three, broken the everlasting covenant. So in other words, the earth was defiled for three reasons, and for these three reasons, destruction comes upon the world. Notice what we find in Isaiah 24 and verse 6. After saying that this desolation comes because 
they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant, we find reiterated in verse 6 that the curse devoured the earth for these three reasons. It says in verse 6, Therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. So notice, Isaiah chapter 24 describes the destruction of the world at the second coming of Christ. And then it says the destruction comes because the world has been morally defiled. And because that moral defilement is related to three specific reasons. The inhabitants of the earth have transgressed the laws, they have changed the ordinance, and they have broken the everlasting covenant. So what we need to do is study these three reasons, and that's going to cover most of our material today. Let's begin by explaining what transgress the laws means. Which laws are being spoken of here? Which ordinance is being spoken of here? Well, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 13 through 15, where we find a description of God coming to Mount Sinai to reveal His will to Israel. I'm reading now from Nehemiah 9 verse 13 through 15. Here, uh, Nehemiah is reminiscing about God coming down to Mount Sinai. It reads as follows, You, that is God, came down also on Mount Sinai, and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them, now notice this, gave them just ordinances and true laws. So notice the two key words there. God at Mount Sinai gave the just ordinances and the true laws, good statutes and commandments. Verse 14, you made known to them, oh, something else, your holy Sabbath, and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your ser servant. Somebody might say, well, but Pastor Bohr, the word laws there is the word Torah. And Torah simply means revelation. It can't be referring specifically to the Ten Commandments. Well, the fact is that it is true that the word uh, Torah can refer not only to the moral law and the moral commandments, it also refers to ceremonial commandments that God gave. So how do we know that this is speaking about moral commandments? It's very, very simple. God would not punish the world, as we've read, for transgressing ceremonial prescriptions, because the ceremonial prescriptions were nailed to the cross. Would God punish the world at the second coming for violating ceremonial laws when those ceremonial laws came to an end at the cross? No. So the word laws here must refer to more God's moral law, not ceremonial laws who passed away, which passed away at the cross. Incidentally, it is possible that the original word Torah was in singular rather than in plural. The Syriac version and the Septuagint, as well as the Chaldee version of the Old Testament, has the word laws in singular as law. So we find that the transgression of God's moral laws is one of the reasons why the earth is defiled and why destruction is going to come. I want to read now from 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, where we have a connection with what we've been studying from Isaiah chapter 24. Here we find in 1 John 3 verse 4 a definition of sin. In fact, Ellen White tells us that is the only definition of sin that we find in Scripture. And I'm reading from uh, the King James Version. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Very interesting. 
We read in Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 6 that one of the reasons for the defilement and the destruction is that the inhabitants of the earth were transgressing God's laws, or law, perhaps it was singular. Here we find in 1 John chapter 3 verse 4 that sin is the transgression of the law. Now, once again I repeat that God would not condemn the world for disobeying ceremonial laws. This must be referring to the moral law of God. You know the Bible tells us that at the end of time one of the characteristics of the world is going to be transgression of the law, not only by the people who profess no religion, not only by atheists, but also by people who claim to serve the Lord. Notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. Matthew 24 and verse 12. This is the famous uh, chapter in the New Testament where Jesus describes the signs of His second coming. And He stated, and because lawlessness will abound, you know that word lawlessness there is the same word that is translated transgression of the law in 1 John 3, 4. So we could translate it, and because of the transgression of the law will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So notice, this is very interesting, the love of many cannot grow cold unless at some time before it was hot. So this means there's going to be an apostasy among those who claim to be God's people. So Jesus says, and because of transgression of the law, same expression is in Isaiah chapter 24, the love of many will grow cold, because uh, basically the law is a law of love, and when we transgress the law, love does not exist. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23 is another text that tells us that many who claim to follow Jesus are actually going to be transgressors of the law. Matthew 7 verse 23 tells us that uh, actually if you read verse 22 it says that many will say to Jesus in that day, did we not prophesy in your name? So they must be Christians because they're professing His name. Did we not perform miracles in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And uh, you know Jesus doesn't say, oh yeah you're all mine because you use my name. Notice what He says in Matthew 7 verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Once again, the word lawlessness there is the same as in 1 John 3, 4. It can be translated, you who transgress the law. Profess followers of Jesus who are transgressing the law. Notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, where we find that the final generation of the wicked will contrast with the life that Jesus led. It says in Hebrews 1 and verse 8, but to the Son, He says, this is the God the Father speaking, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Speaking then about Jesus the Messiah, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Once again that word lawlessness is anomias. It is the same word that is translated transgression of the law in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. So really it's saying you have loved righteousness and hated the transgression of the law. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. It's no coincidence that in uh, the Antichrist passage of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, we are told that this uh, Antichrist is the leader of what is called the mystery of lawlessness. In other words, the mystery of the transgression of the law. It will be a system that encourages people to transgress the law, but it is not a non-Christian system, it is a system that claims to be Christian that is going to be teaching people that in some way they can transgress God's holy law. So the first reason for the defilement of the world and for its destruction is the people are going to transgress God's law or God's laws, which must refer to His moral laws because 
if it dealt with the ceremonial laws, God would not punish the world for laws that were nailed to the cross, the ceremonial laws. So it must be God's moral law. The world is breaking God's law. Now let's go to the second reason for the defilement of the world and its destruction. Change the ordinance. Change the ordinance. Notice that the word ordinance is in singular. Change the ordinance. Now what does the word change mean? Let me just mention that in Genesis 31 and verse 7, uh, it tells us that Laban changed Jacob's salary ten times. In Genesis chapter 41 and verse 14, we find that Joseph changed his garments before he appeared before Pharaoh. The Hebrew word change that is used here, listen carefully, is also translated abolish in Isaiah 2 verse 18 and alter in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 10. Very interesting. In other words, there's an ordinance that was changed that defiled the world and led the world to be destroyed. And of course the question is, which ordinance was changed or which ordinance was abolished or altered? Well, let me explain first of all the meaning of the word ordinance here. Lexicographers explain that the original Hebrew word chok, which is uh, uh, the word that is used here for ordinance, means the following, to scratch or engrave, cutting in or engraving in stone. Isn't that interesting? The original of the word ordinance, chok, is to scratch or engrave, cutting in or engraving in stone. In other words, engraving something in stone. Thus, according to the best Hebrew scholars, the original root of this word means, and I quote, to engrave laws upon slabs of stone or metal to set them in a public place. That's according to Jack Lewis in the volume Theological Word Book of the Old Testament, volume 1, page 317. Very interesting. So the root means to engrave laws upon slabs of stone or metal to set them in a public place. According to the lexicon of Brown, Driver, and Briggs, the word means to cut in, to cut upon, to engrave, to inscribe, to trace, and to mark out. The word frequently appears accompanied by other words which are synonymous in the Old Testament. Words such as testimony, word, law, judgment, and commandment. Vine's Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words explains the meaning of the word ordinance and the relationship that it has with other words. The word's synonyms are mitzvah, that is commandment, mishpat, judgment, berit, covenant, Torah, law, and aduth, testimony. It is not easy to distinguish between these synonyms as they are often found in conjunction with each other. So what is meant by the word chok, the word ordinance? Well, it's used in Scripture to describe certain things that God established at creation that are not changeable. Let me give you several examples. And I'm going to read from the New International Version because the translation is clearer. We find in Proverbs 8 and verse 29 that God established at creation bounds for the sea. We find there the following words. When He gave the sea its boundary, that's the word chok. When He gave the sea its boundary, so the waters would not overstep His command. And when He marked out the foundations of the earth. So notice at the beginning, God enclosed the sea so the sea would not go out of its bounds. Of course, at the flood, God reversed that and He allowed the waters to totally cover the earth. But at creation, God established a boundary, a hook for the sea. 
Notice also Job 38 verses 8 through 11 where once again we find a description of God shutting in the sea by divine command at the very beginning. It says there, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, that is at creation, because the whole earth was created, was uh, covered by water. So once again, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed hook, see once again, when I fixed limits is translated in the NIV, for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, he's speaking to the sea, this far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. So chok is a divine decree that took place at creation, a divine command for the sea to stay within its bounds. But God also made a hook for heavenly bodies. Psalm 148 verse 3 and verse 6, and I'm reading now from the New King James Version, uh, most of them are from the NIV, but this one is from the New King James. Praise ye Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you stars of light. That's verse 3. Verse 6. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave hook decree that will never pass away. God placed the heavenly bodies up there by a divine decree at creation. It's also used for the cycle of the rain. Notice Job 28 verse 25 and 26. Once again I'm reading from the NIV. When He established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when He made a hook that is a decree for the rain and path for the thunderstorm. So once rain began to fall, at the time of the flood, God established a decree for the rain to fall. We also notice in Jeremiah 5 verse 24 that God established the seasons of the year. It says there in Jeremiah 5 24, they do not say to themselves, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives autumn and spring rains in season, who assures us of the hook weeks of harvest, the established weeks of harvest that God established at the very beginning of time. The word is also used to describe God's everlasting covenant, which is, which is not changed. Notice 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 17. This is the covenant that God made, makes with Abraham. It says there in uh, chapter uh, 16 and verse 17 of 1 Chronicles, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac, he confirmed it to Jacob as a hook, in other words, as a decree, a divine decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. And you know it's very interesting that God said to David, that he will not change his covenant, he will not alter his everlasting covenant. Notice what we find in Psalm 89 and verse 34. Psalm 89 and verse 34. God is speaking here and he says, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. God does not alter his covenant. Now isn't it interesting that God engraved the Ten Commandments on tables of stone with His own finger to denote their permanence. The word chok, the root of the word, describes something being engraved on slabs of stone or on metal. Very, very interesting. What about the Ten Commandments? Notice Exodus 32 verses 16 and 17, Exodus 32, 16 and 17, it's speaking about the tables of stone. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. 
So is it just possible that the laws that are being spoken of in the book of Isaiah are the Ten Commandments engraved on slabs of stone? That's the meaning of the word ordinance in its root. The change of the ordinance, by the way, reminds us of the work of the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, who intended to change God's holy law. The word changed and law is used there in Daniel 7 verse 25. We are reminding that the root meaning of the word chok is to etch or to engrave. What change did the Roman Catholic papacy attempt to make in God's law engraved or etched on tables of stone? What divine ordinance that God established at creation and engraved in the Ten Commandments did the papacy attempt to change? The answer is inevitable. It's God's Sabbath commandment because the papacy says it's Sunday. Pope Francis says we need to set aside Sunday to commemorate creation. The Bible says it's the Sabbath. So the Roman Catholic system has claimed to change what God established as a decree at creation. Actually, the present day papacy is also guilty of accepting another change in God's creation order, a change in the marriage. And you say, how is that? Well, let's notice another ordinance that God established at creation. Let's read several statements here from the Spirit of Prophecy on another ordinance besides the Sabbath. By the way, I'm referring to marriage, which God established before sin as between a man and a woman. This statement is from the book Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, Adultery and Divorce. Notice what Ellen White writes about marriage. Marriage was from creation, constituted by God as a divine ordinance. Interesting, divine ordinance, the word that we find in Isaiah. Marriage was from creation, constituted by God as a divine ordinance. It was God, hok, if you please. She continues, the marriage institution was made in Eden. The, now she comes to the other institution. The Sabbath of the fourth commandment was instituted in Eden. When the foundations of the world were laid, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Then let this God's institution of marriage stand before you as firm as the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. So there are two divine ordinances, hook that God established by decree at the very beginning, the Sabbath and marriage between a man and a woman. We find in Desire of Ages, page 281, these words. Once again, the word ordained with regards to the Sabbath. Ellen White wrote, The Sabbath was hallowed at creation as ordained for man, it had its origin when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Ellen White wrote in early writings, page 217, I was shown that the law of God would stand forever and exist in the new earth to all eternity at the creation. When the foundation of, foundations of the earth were laid, the sons of God looked with admiration upon the work of the Creator. And all the heavenly hosts shouted for joy. It was then that the foundation of the Sabbath was laid. I saw that the Sabbath will never be done away, but that the redeemed saints and all the angelic host will observe it in honor of the great Creator for all eternity. It is a divine hook, folks, a divine ordinance established at creation which will persist into eternity. In Patriarchs and Prophets, Page 111, we find these words, like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation, and it has been preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. God Himself measured off the first week as a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. See, God not only measured off, uh, you know, the sea and set bounds for it. God not only measured off the heavens and put the heavenly bodies there. God also measured off the, the week days, seven days of 24 hours each. 
She continues writing uh, the following, like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation and has been preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. God Himself measured off the first week as a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. Like every other, it consisted of seven literal days. Six days were employed in the work of creation. Upon the seventh God rested, and He then blessed this day and set it apart as a day of rest for men. You know, the papacy has not only claimed to change God's hoke or God's ordinance established at creation, the papacy today even claims that the story of creation is not literal, it is symbolic, and that this world came into existence through millions and billions of years of macro evolution. If that is not changing God's ordinance, I don't know what is. Ellen White wrote also, all those who hold the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end will keep the seventh day Sabbath which comes to us as marked by the sun. And you know that's important because there are people in the Adventist church today that are saying that the Sabbath that Adventists have kept since the times of the institution, uh, institution of the Seventh-day Adventist church, we're keeping the wrong Sabbath because we have to keep a lunar Sabbath. So that is also changing God's ordinance. By the way, that statement was three selected messages, 318 and 319. Here's another one. Signs of the Times, September 14, 1882. The Creator of the heavens and the earth commanded, The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. This command was enforced by the example of its author, proclaimed with his own voice, and placed in the very bosom of the Decalogue. Wow! God established it by His example, He proclaimed it with His own voice, and it is in the very bosom of the Ten Commandments. Then she writes, but the papal power has removed, which is another word for, for change, has removed this divine ordinance, notice the key word, ordinance, this divine ordinance, and substituted, here's the change, substituted a day that God is not sanctified and upon which He did not rest, the festival so long adored by the heathens as the venerable day of the sun. Once again, Great Controversy 452 and 453, Ellen White wrote, speaking about Isaiah chapter 58, you know, rebuilding the wall and restoring the Sabbath, she wrote, the prophet thus points out the ordinance, notice once again the key word, points out the ordinance which has been forsaken. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. That's repairing the breach that has been made in God's law by removing the Sabbath commandment. She continues, uh, the restorer of the breach, the restore of paths to dwell in. And then she quotes Isaiah 58, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, God says, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight in the Lord. And then Ellen White writes, This prophecy also applies in our time. The breach was made in the law of God when the Sabbath was changed. Notice she's referred to the Sabbath as an ordinance earlier in this quotation. Now she says that the breach was made in the law of God when the Sabbath was changed by the Roman power. But the time has come for that divine institution to be restored. The breach is to be repaired and the foundation of many generations to be raised up. Wow. So people today are saying, well, you know, it's not Sabbath, it's Sunday, or every day, or no day. And they're saying marriage, that's not necessarily between a man and a woman, you know. There, you can have marriage between a man and a man, and a woman and a woman. But that is altering or changing the ordinance that God established at creation. You know, conservative Christians today fight tooth and nail to defend marriage between a man and a woman. And they say the reason why we need to defend marriage between a man and a woman is because God established that at creation. They cry out against liberal culture's attempt to change the marriage institution to, from heterosexual to homosexual. 
However, these conservative Christians, whom we agree with that we need to restore marriage as a divine institution made at creation, are inconsistent because they restore one creation ordinance while they reject the other creation ordinance. They seek to restore marriage between a man and a woman, but when you say, what about the Sabbath? They say, oh no, no, the Sabbath now is Sunday. It is contradictory, folks, to say that marriage is between a man and a woman because God made it so at creation, and in the same breath say that Sabbath observance has been changed from Sabbath to Sunday. This kind of double talk has to come to an end. I challenge Bible believing Christians to restore both creation institutions, the Sabbath and marriage between a man and a woman. After all, both marriage and the Sabbath are symbols of the relationship between God and His people. God used marriage to say, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. In other words, uh, marriage is a symbol of the intimate relationship between God and His people, and the Sabbath is as well. It's the sign between God and His people. Now, what about the third expression that led to the defilement of the world and eventually to its destruction? The third sin that will defile the world and cause its destruction is breaking the everlasting covenant. Now there's only one everlasting covenant in existence in the Bible, and that is the agreement between the Father and the Son that if man should sin, God was going to send Jesus Christ to bear the, the brunt of the guilt of sin and be punished for the sins of the world. And that then He was going to make it possible for man through the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin in the life. You see, the covenant in the Old Testament had two parts. It, it had the Ten Commandments, which are called the covenant, and it also had the ceremonial law, which are also part of the covenant. You say, well, but the ceremonial law has been done away with. Yes, but the ceremonial law pointed to the redemption when Jesus Christ would come to the earth. So in that sense, the fulfillment still endures. Let me read Deuteronomy 4, verses 12 and 13, where the Ten Commandments are called the covenant. It says there, God is speaking here to um, Israel, and the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sounds of, sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. So He declared to you His covenant, which He commanded you to perform. And what, I, what is the covenant? That is the Ten Commandments and He wrote them on two tablets of stone. So notice that the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone are called the covenant. This is the law of the covenant, but then you have the ceremonies of the covenant. Now how do these two relate? You see, the Ten Commandments actually show us that we're sinners and that we need to be redeemed from sin. There's where the ceremonial law comes in. You see, when Israel transgressed the law, they were to look at the lamb being sacrificed as bearing their sins, as taking care of the problem of sin. So uh, the difference between the Old Testament and the times when Christ comes is simply that the ceremonies that pointed to Christ pass away, but what those ceremonies meant in Jesus Christ endure. There was a second aspect to the covenant then, and that was the sacrifice but there's more. Let's notice Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 10 through 12. There's an aspect where people don't like to emphasize. They say, well, the old covenant was law, the New Testament is grace. No, that's, that's a wrong dichotomy, folks. You see, in the Old Testament there's law and grace, and in the New Testament there is also law and grace. You see, God wants to do two things. Through the Ten Commandments, He wants to show us that we're sinners, so that we come to Christ, and then when we come to Christ, we can be, have the assurance of forgiveness, and then Jesus says, but I want to take that law that you transgressed, and now it's taken care of, the guilt uh, I've assumed, and the punishment I've assumed in your place, now I want to take that law, and I want to write it in your mind and in your heart. Let's read about it in Hebrews chapter 8 
and verses 10 through 12. Hebrews 8 verses 10 through 12. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. By the way, this is coming from Jeremiah 31. Words spoken by Jeremiah to Israel. And then it continues saying, verse 12, For I will be merciful to their trans unrighteousnesses and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. And so notice, the Ten Commandments show us that we're sinners and that we're doomed to die. But the Ten Commandments say there's a solution to the problem. Now that you've seen your sin, come to Jesus Christ. He bore your sins. He died for your sins. If you receive Him, you receive forgiveness for your sins. You are accepted in the Beloved. And then uh, God says, and by the way, once you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, once the guilt of your sin is taken care of, now I want to take care of the power. I want to write my law in your mind and in your heart. By the way, what changes between the two covenants is not the Ten Commandments. What changes is the place where the Ten Commandments are written. In the Old Covenant, they were written on tables of stone, although God wanted the Ten Commandments to be in the hearts of Israel, according to Jeremiah 31. But under the New Covenant, God not only wants us to look at the Ten Commandments as a bunch of rules written on tables of stone, He wants us to realize that the Ten Commandments describe the character of God and that we should reflect the character of God. Now, you say, Pastor Boy, you're teaching salvation by works. No, I'm not teaching salvation by works. We're saved by grace through faith by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But when we embrace His righteousness, He works in us. They are not our works, they are His works through the Holy Spirit in us. And if He is not working in us, it is because we have not truly embraced Him as our Savior. Notice Isaiah 26 and verse 12. This is in the little apocalypse that we're talking about. Here are the words in Isaiah 26 verse 12. Lord, you will establish peace for us, for you have also done all our works in us. <laughs> Beautiful. God will establish peace for us. Why? Because He has done all our works in us when we submit to Him. You're all probably acquainted with Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Here the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. And then he says this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now wait a minute, I thought God is the one that works our own salvation. Here it says we're supposed to work our own salvation. Well, we need to finish reading the next verse. Once again, therefore my beloved, you have, um, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. So we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling by allow him, him, allowing Him to work in us. Notice Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, the same idea coming through, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And many people like to quote verses 8 and 9, but they kind of skip away verse 10. It says there, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now when Paul here speaks of works, it's not works that are produced by me. And I say, oh Lord, I'm pretty good now. Uh, give me some brownie points, please, because I've obeyed your, your will. No, that's not the way it works. Notice verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So who is it that prepares the works? It's God who prepares the works. It's God who works in us. 
He writes his law in our minds and in our hearts. By the way, uh, justification is not just some cheap way to get off the hook. When we are justified, we say, oh Lord, I was doomed to die. And, and you took the, my punishment upon yourself. Oh Jesus, I love you so much. I don't want to continue sinning because it hurts you so much. Please Jesus, write your law on my mind and on my heart so that I can live in harmony with your will. Notice Hebrews chapter 13 verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, there you have one aspect, the blood of the everlasting covenant. Jesus took our guilt and He suffered death in our place so that we could be justified. But there's more. Once again, now may the God of peace, who brought you up, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you, who is working? He's working. Working in you what is well pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So the question is, how can this be done? How is it possible to overcome sin in our lives? It's very simple. Our minds need to be stayed on the Lord Jesus and not on the television, not on our cell phones, not on a worldly music, not on worldly movies. Our eyes have to be focused on Jesus. Notice Isaiah 26 and verses 1 to 3. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Notice it doesn't say here uh, whose mind glimpses you or glances at you. It says whose mind is stayed on you. In other words, a lingering dwelling upon Jesus. The Apostle Paul expressed it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. By beholding we are changed. We are composed of what we eat physically, but we are also composed of what we eat spiritually. If we're filling our mind with all kinds of trash, we can't expect to live a life of victory. Our mind has to be stayed on Christ. We need to behold Him, and we are transformed or changed. Notice this word transformed that Paul uses is the word metamorpho, where we get the word metamorphosis one, uh, from. Let me ask you, in what way is a caterpillar and a butterfly in what way are they similar? They're not similar at all. One is like a worm and the other one flies and is very, very beautiful. But that's what happens when our mind is stayed on Jesus. We are changed from glory to glory into His same likeness. I want to read a commentary of Ellen White in the book Sons and Daughters of God, page 337, about what happens when we behold Jesus Christ. Not uh, occasionally, but have our mind fixed or stayed on Him. This is what Ellen White wrote. By beholding Christ, by talking of Him, by beholding the loveliness of His character, we become changed. Changed from glory to glory. And what is glory? Character. And He becomes changed from character to character. Thus we see that there is a work of purification that goes on by beholding Jesus. What a beautiful statement. So what is glory? Glory is character. And be, by, by beholding the beautiful character of Jesus and not the trash of the world, 
we are changed into the same likeness of Jesus Christ. Who are the only ones who are going to be allowed into the holy city? Revelation 22 verses 14 and 15 tells us who will be allowed into the holy city. It says, Blessed are those who do His commandments. By the way, the Bible tells us that Satan hates those who keep the commandments. You can read it in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 where it says that the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and, the and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it says, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. So all of those in the city will be commandment keepers. What about those outside the city? They will be commandment breakers. Because verse 15 tells us, but outside are dogs. It's not talking about our mascots. It's not talking about the dogs that we have at home. No. Dogs are unclean creatures according to the Bible. So it's referring to people who are unclean. Dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. All of these things that are mentioned here in verse 15 have to do with breaking the Ten Commandments. So inside the city will be commandment keepers, outside the city will be commandment breakers. And those inside did not enter the city because they kept the commandments. They entered the city because Jesus Christ took their penalty and Jesus Christ wrote the law in their hearts so that they would do His will and not their will. So folks, we have in Isaiah chapter 24, a powerful witness as to why the world will be defiled at the end of time and why destruction is going to come. It is going to come for three reasons as we've seen. Because the world will be transgressing God's laws. They will be transgressing the Ten Commandments as we noticed. Secondly, they will be changing the ordinance which specifically refers to the ordinance of marriage that God established at the beginning, so in some way they're going to try and change the marriage institution. And secondly, they are going to attempt to change God's holy Sabbath, the Sabbath He established at creation, the ordinance He established at creation, as the day that God's people are supposed to keep in honor of creation and redemption. And then you have the last reason they broke the everlasting covenant. In other words, they did not keep God's law because their heart was far from the Lord even though they served the Lord with their lips. So folks, what is the lesson we want to learn from this? The lesson we want to learn is that we need to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. We need to be sorry for sin. We need to see how terrible sin is. It led Jesus to the cross. And when we behold Jesus on the cross, the law tells us, you're doomed to death. But go to Jesus. And so when we receive Him into our life, into our hearts, He takes His righteousness and He places, us to our, places it to our account. And then we say, oh Lord Jesus, we love you so much. We hate sin. We don't want to break the commandments anymore. Please work in us to do your will. May that be our experience is my prayer. Lift your voices and sing with us hymn number 118, The First Noel. Shining in 
Let us pray. Our Father and our God, how wonderful it is to have your word in these times of distress. We thank you for the promises of your word that give us the assurance that all will end well, even though everything seems to be in disorder and disarray these days. I ask, Lord, that you will bless everyone who has watched this program that you will bring comfort and you will bring peace and you will bring joy to each life. We know that the end is coming very, very soon. The signs indicate it. Help us, Lord, to prepare a character fit for heaven. And we thank you for being with us and for answering our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 